It's time that we acclaim a certain gentleman whose name was once upon the tip of every tongue. Bull whip, bull whip, bull whip griffin. Do 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 do. Bull whip griffin is here. It's time for bull whip griffin. This has been a often requested film that we do. Uh, Jared and I. So we're, tonight we're going to talk all about the 1967 film Bullwhip Griffin. And uh, I'm going to let Jared into the live chat here. He just joined. So as soon as he requests, I'm going to let him in. This is a great movie. I love it. And I'm so glad that it's on Disney+. Plus. We've done a couple movies that weren't on Disney+. Plus. And so now, uh, we're going to go ahead and do one that is. So let me see. It looks like Jared's having a little trouble getting in. So I'll just do a little invite to join here. See if that works. <laughs> Here we go. Hello. <laughs> hey, Jared. It wasn't letting me uh, request. Yeah. Oh, really? Maybe that's a new Instagram feature. Maybe. So I had to actually, there's a button down here. There's like a little dude with the arrow pointing to his neck. Kind of okay. like, here's where you put the noose over Judge Higgins' head. There, <laughs> this part. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> so you click on that, and then I just type in your name, and, and you're in. So, all right. So, are you ready to talk about the adventures of Bullwhip Griffin? I am. Yeah. How about you? Yeah. Let me get some water here. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, been a long time coming. I know quite a few people have requested it, and we've kind of dancing around. Uh, this film <laughs> saying we're going to do it and then we pick something else. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. no, it is good. Like it's, it's not one that I've seen a whole lot. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad to have rewatched it again. Uh, so it'll be, it'll be good. And it'll be nice to hear what people have to say in the chat about it. Uh -huh. you know? Right. Yeah. I think this is kind of one of those where you either really love it or you really don't <laughs> so it's it's corny i mean I, well let, we're going to talk about our impressions of, of bull whip griffin but real quick before we get started um just kind of wanted to catch up with everybody uh see jared you just uh, got back from some filming in canada right yeah i've been uh filming so it's been a while it's been exhausting and it's been great. So yeah. <laughs> I'm glad to be back and glad that we can do this again. Uh huh. Yeah, it's uh, we haven't done one for about a month because you've been gone and I've been busy. Um, so you know, it is what it is. I just had a did a little road trip with my oldest son. Uh, we went out to California, and one of the things well we did a couple of fun disney things the first thing was we went to the tam o'shanter and, and had dinner there yeah which i'm totally jealous of because literally the tam <laughs> the tam o'shanter is <laughs> got to be three miles away from me if that oh, two miles we could have totally met up actually I, I did call jared and i wasn't sure if you were still in canada or not and, and he still was so <laughs> i was still out of town yeah Oh, but uh, it was such a last minute thing, but still it was fun to go in there and and, uh, and visit a place where Walt Disney used to eat dinner. <laughs> it was cool. Yeah, I've uh, never actually been. I drive by it a lot. And honestly, the first, like, I had actually just found out about it recently. Not Well, not recently, like in the past couple of years, because I drove by it and I'm like, ooh, that looks like an interesting place to... Uh, to eat it just looks really cool from the outside and uh then when i did some research i'm like wait a minute there's actually disney ties to this 
Yeah, a lot of Disney ties. And uh, there's a table, table 31, where Walt would eat with his, his uh, peeps and eat prime rib or toad in the hole. I think that's what it's called. That's what my, my son got. So it was fun. Did you, did you get the prime rib? I did. Yeah, totally did. And was it good? It was outstanding. Yeah, it, it's uh, Lori's uh, restaurant. I didn't know that until we got there. She was like, yeah, we serve Lori's prime rib. I was just going to get fish and chips, something cheap. But once she said that, I was like, oh, I'm going all out. <laughs> <laughs> so hello, everybody in the chat. Uh, I see that there's quite a few people joined in. A um, uh, question from Thomas Quinstagram says, why does Disney Plus not release its entire catalog on the service? That's the million dollar question. That is a lovely question, yeah. Thomas Quinstagram. And uh, I have no idea. Yeah. Well, this one is on Disney Plus. This one, yeah, it, it, it's weird that they picked this one to be on Disney Plus and not some others, yeah. especially when they edited. I mean, I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about it, but we they edited part of this. Uh, Ex to yeah, they did. Show on Disney Plus, and there are so many Disney movies where they wouldn't have to touch it, but it's it's a it's a weird thing. Mm -hmm. So a little bit about Tam O'Shanter, Robbie C on the scene. I, I love that guy's account. Everybody should be following oh, yeah, Robbie, C, Robbie C on the scene because he takes these cool photos of actual, actual places in movies and then just kind of what, what do you say, juxtaposes like what it looks like today above it or below. Yeah, like and, he'll post, he'll, yeah. he'll, he'll go there and take a picture of him in the scene. It's really cool. It is. It's awesome. Uh, especially when he does 1970s Disney film sites like Freaky Friday. <laughs> but uh, he said that uh, he would he would go with Dave Smith to the TAM every Christmas. Wow, I'm jealous. Yeah, that's awesome. They they have carolers there too. Oh yeah, I guess they get very festive. Uh, Condor Man is Disney, right? Yes, uh, it is. Yeah, Michael Crawford. Uh, I don't think that's on Disney Plus either. That's too bad. Seeing as uh, Disney really loves to celebrate superheroes. <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Let's go with one of the original Disney superheroes, Condor Man, of course. Uh, yeah, so Miss Caters is here, and she's hilarious. She's telling me that she's got, like, her... She's got, like a bunch of disguises. She's going to act like judge Higgins today. And, and she's going to eat gold wrapped chocolate and <laughs> <laughs> she's ready to go. <laughs> yeah. So Robbie, Robbie C has more seventies Disney locations to post. So everybody follow Robbie C right now and, uh, and enjoy those. So the other thing I was going to just real quick, I'll mention this before and then we get started was I was able to visit the Walt Disney family museum not the main museum because I've done that about 20 times, but they had a jungle book exhibit. So I was able to check that out. And that was a lot of fun. Uh, the jungle book is my favorite Disney animated film. And it was just so much fun to spend a couple hours in there viewing all the artwork, listening to the music, learning about the animators that worked on it. Some of the different like uh, storylines that weren't uh, picked up because Walt Disney really didn't want to follow the Rudyard Kipling's uh, version that Bill Pete had come up with. It was kind of dark. So, oh. but you got to see some of his sketches and some of his, his uh, early work on the film before Walt, you know, brought in all the jazzy musicians like Louis Prima and, <laughs> and co to, uh, and Phil Harris to insert a little bit of humor to make the film uh, a really light and well-loved classic that it is today so highly recommend you guys go uh to the family museum up there in san francisco to yeah, uh, see I, that um, i actually was talking to a friend today like one of these we i start back up work again i had a, a couple weeks off but i start back up work again on monday and um i think one of these weekends maybe by the end of the year we'll see i kind of just want to drive up the, i've never been to the family the Walt Disney Family Museum 
And I want to drive up there, even if it's just for a night. It's well worth it. Yeah. And just spend the day there. <laughs> totally do that. Maybe I'll be in town. Yeah, let me, let me know next time you're in yeah. San Francisco, I'll drive up there. All right. Well, we, we visit quite a bit. So, all right, well, let's uh, get into Bullwhip Griffin. So, all right, Jared, when you yeah. first watched Bullwhip Griffin, what were, you, what were your, like, first thought waves and impressions, to, to, to quote Mission uh, Adventures to <laughs> in, Inner Space? <laughs> inner space. Um, the very first time I ever saw it, it was a little bit, I was like, what did I just watch? Honestly, like, and uh -huh. I watch, I love these old Disney movies, but this one was a bit different, although it was a lot the same too of the other Disney movies. Um, it was wacky, but I feel compared to the other Disney movies around that time, that it knew that it was wacky. Yeah, it kind of fits. It, it do, totally does, because it was kind of that era of wackiness. I think Blackbeard's Ghost came out the same year. Mm -hmm. And you've got a, a lot of similar special effects that uh, Used to Slice It did for both of the, those movies. So, I mean, uh, yeah. No Mobile came out that year as well. Yeah. that, that This was the era of... Uh, wacky special effects and uh, the speeding up of the filming <laughs> to, <Yes>. to make <laughs> people are running around really fast when they get thrown by mountain ox uh, <laughs> into watery troughs, you know, it just looks like, wow, they just like fast forward the camera. You know? <laughs> but uh, yeah. And Miss Cater says it's cheese. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I think that's why we all tune in. For these Disney classics because they're so cheesy and corny that it's but I just feel, even though with this one like I feel with this one though even more so than even Blackbeard's Ghost and the Nomobile like the Nomobile it was a fantasy movie mm -hmm. and so it had and so was Blackbeard's Ghost to a degree so they the, it kind of worked with the with it and you didn't really like you know it was wacky but you didn't really think about the wackiness as much as this one where this one was this straightforward type story it was like a living cartoon i feel yeah that's exactly how i felt when i first saw this just you know the opening credits and all mm -hmm. the the little like kind of like vaudevillian style title transitions they're actually yeah. called interstitials. Did you know interstitial titles? Interstitial, <laughs> that just yes. kind of, yeah, they just kind of pop up on the screen while you're watching the movie, and they they uh, move the plot along and uh, probably saves film, and they're hilarious. So I really I, love love that. I, I love that about this movie. I agree. Celebration Disney, Jim. Uh, he said in those other films, the wackiness was meant to be earnest, and that's how I feel. Ah, I agree. yeah. Great way to put it. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, like the fight scene was just hilarious. I laughed the whole way through that. This is so wacky. That we'll get to yes. that later. And Roddy McDowell's character is just over the top, just so gentlemanly, you know, a perfectly proper butler that just like his word is his bond throughout the whole movie. <laughs> <It's just like laughs> <laughs> even to the point where he could probably lose his life, but a gentleman always keeps his word. <laughs> and <laughs> okay, I'm going to get sidetracked for a second here because yep, go for I it. I love, and these are, this is not a Disney movie, but I love the Brady Bunch movies. Okay, the 90s. do you remember those? Uh, yeah, I, I do. I've seen a few. Uh -huh. Where there, it's like a spoof, like. It's a new cast of the Brady Bunch, but basically they're still living in the 70s, but the world around them is in the 90s. And it's just oh, comedy yes. based about yeah. that. And then <laughs> That's the second right. one, <laughs> in the second one, <laughs> Carol's first husband shows up and, um, and he <laughs> throws a wrench in their little marriage, in Mike and Carol's marriage. 
and they're sitting in bed and Carol is like saying to him, saying to Mike, I don't know what to do. I mean, I did marry him first. And then Mike says, and a Brady always keeps a promise. And so <laughs> right. <laughs> you, you, you saying that, he's like, she's like, I promise to love, honor, and obey him. And a Brady always keeps a promise. So you saying you saying that about uh full up Griffin made me made me think of that. Oh, That's a little okay. sidestep. <laughs> this is a little personality trait that you're gonna get to know about Jared is that I love those Brady Bunch movies. Yeah. I need to see those again. <laughs> They're great. They're great. Yep. All right. So uh, let's talk a little bit about what we have here. So show us uh, your Bullwhip Griffin merch. I see some things I don't have. I Okay. So I have the DVD, of course. Okay. Yeah. I've got that. Which uh, there are zero special features on it, although it was widescreen, which that's the most thing I appreciate. Yeah. And it's unedited. Then, uh, the, and the DVD is unedited. Yep. Then, of course, my VHS. <laughs> is that the, the part with... <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. I love the cover. Yeah, that's the part where he kind of climbs up behind Ox and then just punches yeah. him in the face and then get that boing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's my so, gosh. I, I say this all the time, but the way, like, the pictures that they choose on these home videos from the 80s to sell the movie are so bizarre. Yeah. <laughs> uh, then, of course, the record. Okay. Yeah. I have with that, the complete too. story and songs. I know that you have that. Mm -hmm. and yeah. Then, and uh, uh, everybody listening today, if uh, you send me a direct message, I will add you to my Dropbox and I'll share with you the, uh, this album. It's a storyteller album narrated by Brian Russell and contains all the songs from the movies. Those are good. They, they were actually good songs too. They're, yeah. they're definite earworms, or at least the two. Yes, <laughs> totally. I've been uh, whistling then, the ballad of Bullwhip Griffin all week. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're funny too. Like they're the one yeah. you're singing about um, Arabella and they're like, we haven't talked about her in a while basically. <laughs> oh, I know. Yeah. <laughs> I laughed out Six loud. Six weeks later, who we momentarily uh, <laughs> forgot about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> She's on her way, dressed in this awesome green dress. <laughs> <laughs> and then Bullet Griffin was actually based on a novel. And so um, I have the book. Oh, sweet. Yeah. Yeah. You'll probably talk about that a little later. And then these these are just... Like Roddy McDowell was in That Darn Cat, Suzanne Plachette was in Ugly Docks, and, and I forget mm -hmm. the name of the kid, but he was in Emil and the Detectives, so I just put those in there. It's, oh, Emil and the Detectives? Brian yeah. Russell. Yeah. Brian Russell, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the cast a little bit. So, of course, we got Roddy McDowell. Oh, my stuff. Well, I have mm -hmm. the lobby card set, of course, and I'm going to kind of go through those when I talk, when do a real quick summary of the plot. And uh, um, I love, the album. by the way, I love the the posters and the advertisement for this this film. I love all of that. Yeah, yeah. You shared a really cool one on your Instagram page today that I hadn't seen before. That one's really neat. I, I made some edits on it too. <laughs> it says, <laughs> "See, me and Jared talk about bullet." <laughs> Yeah, Very like clever. Disney's, so I cut that out. Yeah. Yeah. I have a friend who's going to make a reel of Bullwhip Griffin, and I'll share that with you. Actually, I asked him if he could make some reels for uh, future films that we do. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah. He popped on here. He, he couldn't stay the whole time. He left already. But uh, that was, I will give him a shout out uh, later when he sends that reel. So he's got a lot. He makes a lot of great reels. Let's see if I can find his name. Here. I am so not. I'm awful I, at making reels. I'm awful I can't at content. Do. Yeah, like I, yeah. I will take a picture of my VHS. <laughs> I will talk to people about it. But I'm yep. so, like I'm not. It's crazy because the job that I do, I'm creative. But when it comes to this kind of stuff, I'm not that creative. 
Yeah. Hey, uh, Mousepiration is in here. That's cool. Thanks for joining. I was on his YouTube show once. Uh, all the ads, amazing. That's right. Uh, all time favorite westerns by Sea Dog. <laughs> that's that's great. Yeah, this is. I would classify this as a Disney western, but it's uh, kind of in the line with like Apple Dumpling Gang, maybe, and Hot Lead and Cold Feet. I would kind of put it in that category of westerns. Not not the serious yep. westerns like Davy Crockett, Davy Crockett, or <laughs> One Little Indian, or something. But here's the thing: couldn't it be like it's like a spoof? It's it kind is of like a spoof, Davy Crockett. Yeah, would it be like a Mel Mel Brooks kind of? It w yes. Western. I mean, look at the <laughs> look at the picture on your uh, look at him like hitting the bear, like attacking the bear. It's. Oh yeah, it's this one here. Bit, yep. You know, yeah. Yep. Uh huh. That's Bullwhip Brannigan. <laughs> so, okay. So yeah, the the album. I have the album, and this is very informative. This album because there was a a, a little bit some contention <laughs> as to who wrote what songs in the movie, and mm. if you watch the the credits of the film, uh, it doesn't really tell you. So, here on this record album's label. Okay. Uh, okay. You've got the uh, side one. You've got California Gold written by the Sherman Brothers. So there you go. Uh, this, this album that I'll share with everybody is narrated by Brian Russell, who was actually an actor in the film. A lot of the Disneyland storyteller records have these wacky versions that don't have any actors in the film in them <laughs> <laughs> on the record. But this one's uh, really good because it actually takes audio clips from the soundtrack. Oh, I like so, that. Yeah. And on the reverse side, we've got uh, The Girls of San Francisco, sung by Suzanne Pochette, uh, written by Richard M. Sherman and Robert B. Sherman, and The Bullwhip Griffin. I call it like the ballad. That was right, written yeah. by Mel Levin and George Bruns. Mm. that answers the questions of, of, of a couple podcasts I listened to this week that didn't know who wrote uh, the ballad. So there you go. Mel Levin and George Bruns. George Bruns wrote the soundtrack to the film and Walter Sheets orchestrated it. So. I mean, I, what I, I don't even know what I was going to say. Sorry, go on. Okay, well, we're just going to get into the cast. So, okay. <laughs> of course, we've already talked about Roddy McDowell playing Bullwhip Griffin, and we've seen him in That Darn Cat. He's in Bed Knobs and Broomsticks, The Cat from Outer Space, and voices uh, Vincent in The Black Hole, I think. He's oh, yeah. Like one of the robot garbage cans. <laughs> yep. And while I'm going through the cast, I'm also going to give a little shout out to these, these, uh, the credits, the credits in this film are just amazing. Like the, the opening title sequence is so fun. I like, mm -hmm. I watched the credits six times. Oh, wow. Well, yeah. Once, well, for two reasons, once one, because they're so much fun to watch. There's a lot of animation going on and two, the song, the lyrics. And I put the subtitles on because the lyrics to the Bullwhip Griffin ballad are just so uh revealing <laughs> i guess <laughs> <laughs> and that's another reason why you can tell that it's not it's not a sherman brothers style set of lyrics you know the, the sherman brothers lyrics are really simple they repeat but the uh, bullwhip griffin ballad is very narrative i guess you could say uh, a lot of fun i i sang a few lines from at the beginning as it's time that we acclaim a certain gentleman whose name was once upon the tip of every tongue back in the early days of wicked San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. So the credits, so during the credits, each character in the film has a little, uh, a little picture or something next to their name. So as I go through, I'm going to mention what that was. So Bullet Griffin, of course, had a little butler's outfit next to his name. Arabella Flagg was played by Suzanne Pochette, who we know in lots of 
Disney films, The Ugly Dachshund, Blackbeard's Ghost. We talked about that one on a previous episode. And she has this like little proscenium thing that's uh, above her name because she's the Boston Belle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and Judge Higgins, played by Carl Malden, he's got this little open safe with no gold in it. So you kind of know what's going on by looking at these credits, who they're playing in the movie. Uh, of course, Carl Malden was in Pollyanna. He was Reverend Ford, so it did a total 180. Pull <laughs> up Griffin. Uh, Sam Trimble was Harry Gard or Harry Gardino played Sam Trimble, the owner of the Lucky Nugget, and his little icon were Snake Eyes Dice. <laughs> <laughs> Quentin Bartlett was played by Richard Hayden, uh, who voiced the Caterpillar in Alice in Wonderland. You can hear that. In, you can 100% hear that. Yeah, a lot. Because he really played like a thespian throughout this film. And, uh, oh, Miss Caters. She says she's going to assume I'm going to talk about who drew the credits. Go ahead, Miss Caters, if you know the artist. Throw that out there. Yeah, who who was the animator for the credits and all the interstitials and all the animated special effects in this film? Very popular Disney animator, uh, one of the nine old men, in fact. And the little cherub. And the little cherubs, yes. <laughs> <laughs> he liked trains, also. <laughs> and he, had, he played the trombone and wore these really thick black horn-rimmed glasses, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Where was I? Uh, oh, Quentin Bartlett. Uh, the Sound of Music. He was in that. He was Max Detweiler. If you remember that. Oh. From that crazy, crazy, awesome movie with Julie Andrews. And uh, who was the guy that she liked? I can't. He just recently passed away. Uh, who was the, uh, the Sound of Music? Yeah. Plummer? The father of all the children. Christopher Plummer. Christopher yeah. Plummer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so Quentin Bartlett's uh, little icon was a, like a thespian mask or a little theater mask. Uh, Miss Irene Chesney was played by Hermione Badley. And she is the, um, in the beginning of the film, we meet her. She's one of the housekeepers. So she's got a little duster <laughs> by her name. And of oh, course, she was a housekeeper. What a surprise. Housekeeper. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I mean, she did that in Mary Poppins. She did it in The Happiest Millionaire. Uh, did you know she was the voice for Madame Adelaide Bonfamille in The Aristocats? I didn't know that. I did not. Yeah. So cool. Uh, you know, I'm actually going to see The Aristocats on thir on Sunday afternoon at the New Beverly. Oh, on the big screen? Yeah, on the big screen. Lucky. I just That's went awesome. And, last Sunday, I went, well, Jim and I went and saw Sleeping Beauty this last Sunday. Oh, and then they're that's showing, cool. Yeah, they're showing her. Oh, I'd love to see Sleeping Beauty on the big screen. I did when it I was, was a kid. Blew me it away. Was full. It was a full theater. It was awesome. I bet. That's cool. All we get is Marvel films on the big screen. Okay, I digress. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that's uh, uh, the next character is Jack Flagg, played by Brian Russell, and we know him from Emil and the Detectives. He also had a small role in Babes in Toyland. He's, his little icon next to his name is like a little sleuth cap, and hmm. I couldn't figure out why. That didn't really fit this film, but it fits Emil and the Detectives. <laughs> or maybe it's just like one of those little hats that you, know, you, you wear in Boston. I don't know. Yeah, uh, that's odd. Uh, captain Swain is uh, played by Liam Redman. You know, he's the captain of the ship that sails from Boston to San Francisco. And he's got a little ship captain's hat next to his name. And this one's fun. The Bandito Leader was played by Joby Baker. And we know him as uh, Silky Seymour from Blackbeard's Ghost. But he yes. played a Hispanic... Uh, bandito in this movie <laughs> and his little icon is a sombrero <laughs> oh. 
And then, of course, uh, some other characters. Uh, we've got Mountain Knox, who's played by Mike Mazurki. He appeared in uh, both of the Davy Crockett films, Bigfoot See? Mason and those. Yeah. See? Yeah. Oh, would I watch this on the big screen CD dog? Yeah, of course. I absolutely would. I'd stop if it was on right now. I would go do it. <laughs> so, yeah, it's it was cool to see Mike Mazurki come back in, in another Disney film. He, uh, he lost to Davy Crockett in the shootout. Remember, he shot first, shot right mm -hmm. through the center of the target, and then Davy Crockett shot right through the hole that Mazurki made. <laughs> so, well, maybe he should maybe he should start being on the good side. Yeah. He lost in this one. Turns out he's a real good guy. You know, he was a professional football player, wrestler, actually got a law degree at Fordham and spent some time as an attorney. You wouldn't know that by <laughs> looking at his character. In this no. <laughs> no. Okay. And then the last couple of guys I'll mention are all dudes that we know from uh, Blackbeard's Ghost, like Gil Lamb. You remember the waiter in Blackbeard's Ghost with the salad <laughs> always tripping and everything? He makes an <laughs> appearance in this. Tom Carney, the bartender in Blackbeard's Ghost, is also a bartender in this movie. He's kind of like, he's a bartender slash bookkeeper uh, who makes a, a rather uh, uh, ill-advised hiring of another bookkeeper at a most uh, pivotal yeah. point in the film. Yeah. Uh, James McDonald, who is a very, who's very well known in the Disney uh, company as a sound effects specialist. He did like all the sound effects. He was uh, had an on-screen appearance in this film. He was the saloon percussionist. And my favorite cast member in this film, because when I see him, I'm like, I know this guy. I don't have any idea what other movies he's been in because I, I couldn't find his name anywhere, but I finally tracked it down today. So you remember when Bullwhip and uh, Jack arrived to Shirt Tail Camp? And they see this man uh, standing in a doorway eating chow. Oh, yeah, eating the one rice. Without, you see the one without the teeth? Yeah, no teeth. Yeah. That's Arthur Mallet. And he played. Are you guys ready for this? Drum roll. I'm sitting down. He was Mr. Dawes Jr. in Mary Poppins. Really? <laughs> yeah. You know? Yep. Hmm. Yeah. So cool. And That's he actually, awesome. and, and in the Mary Poppins Returns, Mr. Dawes comes back. Mr. Dawes Jr. comes back and is played by a recently deceased awesome actor. Uh, what is his name? Oh, no, you know what? That was not, that was somebody different, actually. And now I'm blanking on, David Warner was in that, but he was Mr. Binnacle or something. So or was he Mr. Dawes Jr.? I can't remember. Who who played Mr. Dawes Jr. in Mary Poppins Returns? Anybody? Somebody looked that up. Oh, nice one, Celebration Disney. Arthur Mallet played King Idelig in The Black Cauldron. Sweet. Yeah, his he voiced that character, obviously. So that's the that's the cast. Great cast. Uh well of course, duh. Dick Van Dyke played Mr. Dawes junior <laughs> okay thanks elmer okay david <laughs> warner that's okay guy oh, thanks thanks elmer all right you put me in my place wow all right so the real quick let's just uh go through the plot so here's the sweet title card and um so the year is 1849, and Jack and Arabella Flagg are orphaned in Boston, and uh, they're like the only relatives of Alonzo Flagg, who's recently passed away. And their former butler, um, well, their current butler, his name's Eric, Eric Griffin. I, I didn't catch that until I watched it like for the third time, that his first name was Eric. <laughs> so well, they're kind of all in the, you know, in the book, his mm -hmm. name is you know what his name is in the book isn't it isn't it praiseworthy or something yes it's praiseworthy <laughs> <laughs> oh praiseworthy
please, were there. Please, were there. Please, make <laughs> me some could... tea and cookies. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Oh, Eric, my gosh. Eric Fitz. Eric Griffin. <laughs> uh, Mr. Praiseworthy, would you please uh, clean my sheets, Praiseworthy? <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. So they're kind of all gathered in the in in the foyer of their home, and a, a man, Mister Pemberton, a lawyer of sorts, he comes in and starts reading off the the will of Alonzo Flag, and everybody's getting like some sweet cash out of this deal, right? Like, you know, the maid gets like a hundred k, the driver gets sixty k, and and the other lady. Uh, gets like 90 or something and they're all like, oh what a great guy and then eric griffin gets five hundred thousand dollars <laughs> mm-hmm. like, and i bet he won't raise Wait. an eyebrow <laughs> he, <laughs> wasn't it did didn't he say or, or could have been wrong but like didn't he say the only way you'll get the five hundred thousand if you is if you don't respond yeah, yeah, he meant it that way. Like, <laughs> upon upon hearing the the amount of this this uh, bequeath, right? He will not so much as raise an eyebrow, and he just his face is like all stern, straight eyebrows, <laughs> perfectly combed hair. <laughs> all right, so it turns out that uh, unfortunately Alonzo Flag was broke. And had no money to give, and so that that means that uh, they got ninety days to get out. Well, Jack is like all big into the gold rush at this time, so he kind of runs away, thinking he can like just go strike it rich in California and bring all the money back and save his sister and save the house. So he's got like ninety days to do it. Mm-hmm. I think that's how long it actually takes for them to sail from Boston to San Francisco. <laughs> Given they have to go all the way around Cape Horn, right? Or... Yeah. <laughs> Back yeah, in they those days. Go... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they have to go a long way. Yeah. So uh, they he stows away on the ship bound for San Francisco out of Boston Harbor. And Eric uh, finds out that he's run away. So he goes after him, uh, convinces the captain that, you know, hey, I'm going to go get I'm going to go get Jack off the ship, but he gets knocked out by Bartlett, <laughs> the, the thespian guy, and they're on their way. So he gets caught and he ends up being like the captain's cook and uh, fixes his meals. So he gains favor of the captain. Uh, on board, they meet Judge Higgins, who's a, who's played by Carl Malden. He's like a swindler and a thief. And he steals this map that Bartlett owns. That's really a, a, a map to like the mother load. I have the a map load. to the mother load. <laughs> and <laughs> the whole the whole movie really is um after Judge Higgins steals the map, you know, he he jumps off board, he grabs a skiff and rows to shore. And um uh the whole movie really turns out to be Jack and Griffin chasing after him to get this map because they're partners with Bartlett. Uh, and they're going to share their, their all the gold they find at the mother load. So, uh, so Jack to stow away on the ship, he fits through like a little porthole window, and and Miss Caters asks, "How did Bartlett get through the porthole?" <laughs> well, that's a porthole or a pothole. <laughs> that's what we call movie magic. Movie magic, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Boy, he got a nice little um, stateroom in the ship, too. Yeah, for real. Yeah, totally did. All right. So they're kind of running around the foothills of California. Um, They run into some banditos. They get robbed. Uh, Judge Higgins is like, he's like, okay, disguise one is, you know, he uh, is a judge. Disguise two, he's a dentist. <laughs> Disguise three, he's like a Chinese man. <laughs> this whole time, they're trying to catch up with him. Um, meanwhile, Arabella, uh, Jack's sister, um, arrives from San, from Boston on the next ship, I guess, <laughs> and gets a job. <laughs> 
Well, we've forgotten about Arabella, remember? They yeah, about... that's right. And this great title sequence comes on. And it's like, oh, yeah, remember Arabella's on her way from Boston. <laughs> and she's got like 17 dresses. The last one's green. She gets <laughs> off the ship and everybody's carrying her luggage. And Sam Quentin picks her up so she doesn't get her shoes all muddy. Something like that. <laughs> that was be- that was absolutely beautiful. Was that I just made it up? <laughs> you did. <laughs> <laughs> so she gets a job at the Lucky Nugget and turns into the Boston uh, Bell. Um, and then one of uh, Sam Quentin's, like his, uh, I guess, what would you call his job? The um, Mount Knox's job at the Lucky Nugget. Uh, bouncer bouncer yeah <laughs> he's a bouncer well he runs into um to uh bullet griffin and uh and jack and i guess bullet he knocks him out right and sam quentin learns of bullets you know th- that he f- knocked him out so he's like the only guy in town that could possibly beat beat mountain knock so he stages like a uh a boxing match which is like the um the climactic scene of this film where everything hinges on this mat this match right <laughs> <laughs> the the future fortunes of sam and uh boab griffin and everybody <laughs> hinge on this wonderful matching we're going to get into a lot of this stuff later as we talk about our favorite scenes so i'm just kind of really quickly going through the plot so uh, i'm not going to give away who won but uh, it resolves so much <laughs> and yet so little. <laughs> Thank you for being uh, spoiler free. Yeah, spoiler free. So all in all, this is just a wacky movie, you know, with lots of crazy characters, lots of fun animated sequences. Uh, these titles that buzz on the screen, that they give you so much information and in such little time. And, and uh just great special effects and fun stuff. But before we talk about like our favorite scenes and we'll talk more about what we really liked about this movie and what made us like laugh our heads off and snort and have tears. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Jared's going to tears of joy, tears of pain. Uh, Okay. So Jared is going to give us a little bit of background on, on the history of of the making of the film, like who directed it and stuff. So take it away, Jared. (laughs) I forgot to go through all the title cards. Well, there's San Francisco and there they are. Okay. I'm going to leave this one up because this is one of my favorite scenes. Um, And then there's, there's uh, when they get robbed by the banditos. (laughs) Oh my gosh, there's a lot of funny stuff in that one too. There's Mount Knox bouncing out a guy who, wow, see, that's just Mount Knox being Mount Knox right there. Mike Mazurki. Look at all these towns, folks. They're awesome. <laughs> uh, there, this is an interesting shot because it's not in the film, right? There's uh, That's Harry Gordino and Suzanne Pochette, and she's probably going through the lyrics of Kiss me again, wherever you are, in Suzanne's classic sultry, smoke-filled lungs voice. Oh, she's great. She's just awesome. And and I just absolutely love her rendition of that song. And there she is in the girls. Yeah, the girls of San Francisco. Uh, This girl on the right, we're going to talk about her later. She's kind of got a parachute dress. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh, stupid. yep. So stupid. Yep. This when girl looks like stu- she's been at the Lucky Nugget since opening day. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> um, be nice. <laughs> and uh oh that's when Arabella, who's already she's been in San Francisco for a while, and then Jack and uh Griffin come back and they they uh okay, I'm gonna talk about that later because that's one of my favorite scenes. And then, of course, the boxing match. So I'm going to leave that one up. And then this one, because I'm going to talk about it later. That's Quentin Bartlett right there, Richard Hayden. All right, go for it, Jared. Sorry. I always say I'm going to run through the lobby cards, and I never do. Uh, All right. (laughs) 
<laughs> uh, well, I mean, there's not a whole lot of like, I wouldn't say there's a whole lot of history as far as like this goes. Uh, they, it was based on a book, like I said, but it was called By the Great Horn Spoon. Yeah. So, and I think Miss Cater, <laughs> Miss Cater is like, I'm so glad that it didn't stick to the original name. And this is yeah. my, this is my um, <laughs> thought process. It's just what I think might have happened. I could be wrong. A few years before this, they released The Misadventures of Merlin Jones. Mm -hmm. And it was very profitable for the Disney company. And so I think when they decided on this, because it's a, even the adventures of Bullwhip, Bullwhip Griffin is kind of generic. I feel. And so my thought process is maybe they will be able to bring people in with a title similar mm. to the misadventures. Yeah. Of the I, I also could be way off. On I, that and assessment. It, it, it might be another thing where uh, they want male audience members, like the adventures of the, you know, I right. don't know. Yeah. It's uh, interesting that they, chose this title I, yeah i because i guess i'm kind of with miss caters it's probably the worst thing in this movie is the title and it could have been the adventures of praiseworthy griffin but they didn't yeah they or didn't the, the adventures of praiseworthy griffin through the during the gold rush of san francisco i thought they should have incorporated the gold rush because that i think that would have got a lot more folks i mean what 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 did this film earn yeah it did not make much money at all. It had a budget of oh. two point five million, and it did not earn. It money. lost money. It, it lost money. Yes. Oh, okay. Rats. So, uh, and it was <laughs> the inter and it was a based on a children's novel by Sid Fleischman, uh, okay. and it was published in sixty three. So, sixty three to sixty seven is not that long. And actually, principal photography for this was in 1965. So two years, two years after the book was written. Oh wow! Okay, so they Walt was uh, very much involved in this film. Yep. Yeah. And it was filmed all on the studio lot in Burbank, except for one scene. Okay, what's was, that? Because I couldn't find any information on some of the scenes, like the I bandito scene. Either. I couldn't either. I'm guessing it's the scene. I'm guessing it's the scene when they are out in the, uh, like where the banditos. Yeah, they they hop along the Sacramento Hangtown stagecoach. Yeah, and they're in the, you know, that area looks really familiar. Like it's probably in Newhall, up there, the Golden Oak Ranch, or outside of the Golden Oak Ranch, and, and those those mountains there. The Placerita, okay. Can Placerita Canyon, that's kind of where they did a lot of the, the outdoors, kind of Western shots. I bet that's where it was. Well, the only other thing is, this I guess is a little fun fact. Did you know that a few days after filming had begun, um, that Roddy McDowell had broken his right hand during the grave digging scene? <laughs> yeah, I jotted that down. Isn't that wacky? <laughs> That's when I rewatched it, oh, go ahead. Only four days. It said on May seventh is when he broke it, and they started filming on May third. Oh my gosh! Did you re rewatch the grave digging scene and and see? I did not. I, no, I, mean, I couldn't I tell the movie again today. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so then it was uh, directed by. James Nielsen. Oh, who, Moon Spinners. Who, <laughs> Moon Spinners. Boy. And he did a bunch of Disney stuff. I, we've already talked because we did our Summer Magic thing, but uh, Summer Magic, which came out in 1963, the same year that Bull Griffin, or I'm sorry, the Bighorn, whatever the name of this book is, <laughs> uh, the, came out. The, the Big Spoon. Uh, Moon Pilot. <laughs> Moon Pilot, Bon Voyage, Moon Cussers, Dr. Sin, Alias, The Scarecrow, which I love that. 
Oh, that's right. He's the Moon Special movie Square. director. That's right. The Moon one, yep. Johnny Shiloh, yeah. Moon Spinners. And um, Oh, Miss Cater says if you watch the end of the grave digging scene that Roddy McDowell doesn't use his right hand. Okay, I'm going to watch that again. Great. Yeah, Great eagle that. eyes. Nice job. So yeah, he's a he's a great director. Well, he got mixed reviews for this film. Because one of his early films, The Summer Ma at least for me, is Summer Magic, which is just been oh, phenomenal. Right. That yeah. Oh, so we've done two James Nielsen movies in a row. Okay. Yeah. But the ones that he's done that he's done well, several of the ones that he's done, I've actually really enjoyed. <clears throat> he also directed, and this is a little bit, it's not Disney related, but kind of. So The Trouble with Angels with Haley Mills. Oh, he did that? Okay. No, he did not. No, he oh, did he not. didn't. <laughs> he did the sequel. Oh, the sequel. Yes. Where okay. Angels Go, Trouble Follows. Yeah. Which starred neither Haley Mills or... No, uh, that's Rosalind, a good trivia. It? Yeah. Oh, Rosalind Russell. Rosalind Russell. Yeah, I love that movie. So yeah, that's a good one. The 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 first one. The first one, yeah. <laughs> Although the last time I this is this might be TMI. The last time I watched it, I was so sick um, that. I don't even know why I'm telling everybody this. I was so sick that I threw up. Oh. So I need to watch it again when I'm not yeah. sick. Oh, don't. Yeah, totally. You need to be in the right mindset. Even when you're watching The Adventures of Bullwhip Griffin, which Sea Dog said was ahead of its time. Maybe. Um, Bullwhip Griffin? Uh, yeah, maybe it was just like right on time. But I think I, I think I understand what he's saying is that a lot of these Disney films were just kind of like, they had to develop funky camera tricks and things that just to make it work and make it believable, <laughs> I guess. And in that uh, way, it was probably ahead of its time. Yeah. I think, Maybe. I think, no, I, I would agree. What I, what I feel with this one is, is they, they tried and I can see what they were trying for. And I just don't know if it 100% made it or 100 percent worked i should say but i feel like if it was 100 would have 100 percent worked it's definitely ahead of its time i would i would i would think that so um so yeah that's yeah. yeah. Like what? Uh, you got I mean, anything else? No, the, the, <laughs> produce, the mu you've already talked about like the music and stuff oh, like that. I'm sorry. No, yeah, no, no. That's we all should right. we should share notes beforehand, so I notes. don't steal your stuff. <laughs> no, it's quite all right. I'm 100 percent fine with that. Uh, you know, pr uh, a lot of these movies are the same producers that do all of these movies. So Bill yeah. Anderson, and then of course Walt Disney. Right. So uh, that's all I got. Okay. Well, let's talk about our favorite scenes. You want to go first with your favorite? So, and everybody listening in, all eight of you, <laughs> uh, go ahead and uh, type in what your favorite scene is. <laughs> nine. Have, we got nine. We I had twenty feeling. at one point. Yeah. Because everybody's everybody who stays on here are awesome. Well, everybody's awesome who even joins. Yeah. So I thank everybody for joining. But I think everybody would probably agree that their favorite scene would, would be the fight. But oh yeah. We, we can talk about that a little later. The other one that makes yeah. me laugh Let's out loud. Let's save every that time, for the end. Okay. The one that makes me laugh out loud every time is when it's right after they're reading the will. And oh, okay. They find, they find, do you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> yeah. Uh huh. And they find out that there's actually no money, and 
they're talking about the they're talking about what what's the guy's name? What's the guy's name who died? Alonzo Flag. They're talking about Alonzo Flag yeah. and about how he probably was doing this on purpose and all that kind of stuff. And they keep cutting to this, <laughs> this Oh, painting, his portrait. His portrait. And every time they cut to his portrait, he is making a different face. And I laugh all the time. Okay, is this like the same picture? Or are there multiple pictures? Because I... It's the same <laughs> picture. <laughs> it's his, his expression changes. Yeah. Wow, that's absolute genius by Eustace Slice it, special effects guy. <laughs> I absolutely love it. And the thing He's is like, too, cut, let's hang up the picture of him mad. Okay, yeah. cut, let's put the happy face picture up on the wall. Okay. Well, they probably just, yeah, they probably just filmed them, the pictures separately. Yeah, of course. But, yeah. Uh, it's, it's so great. And, the, and him smiling looks just like Walter Brennan. Yeah, okay. That, all right. I'm with you on that. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I like that. And yeah. Sassy Hermione. Hermione they, badly. Yeah, Hermione being sassy and then the portrait hating and she's like wanting to sell the portrait for $5. And all yeah, that she ends up, I'll great. take the five. <laughs> I'll take the five. <laughs> <laughs> and then the painting is happy again. Yeah. So. Oh my gosh. Though that makes me laugh every time so isn't it funny that like uh suzanne pushed reaction upon hearing the news is she, she's just laughing her head off she's like oh <laughs> i i lost everything the house the money the furniture <laughs> and uh this is hilarious because she, she kind of expected it she, she probably knew what was going down <laughs> oh yeah she probably knew that grandpa was spinning all you know, he had a, he was partying late nights in Boston, you know, in the 1850s. It gets wild. So <laughs> 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 that the money was gone. And really, I think what she, she was really feeling was like, here, it's freedom. You know, she was free from maybe the Boston aristocracy. And um, she was able to, like, spread her wings and fly. I think she actually said that. She could so, go to California, yeah. you know. She could become the Boston Belle and, uh, whew, yeah, gorgeous. What a lovely actress. She's just awesome. Love Suzanne Pochette. Some of the, uh, okay, Celebration Disney says his favorite scene is the, are the interstitials. So all those little breaks in the action where we get that awesome Ward Kimball animation. But somebody, I think MD Snotty guessed that right. Ward Kimball is the one that did all of the interstitial animation, all of the on screen, like the little cupids flying around. Um, when Roddy McDowell gets green with envy and punches the, the uh, punching mm -hmm. bag. <laughs> and uh, yeah, all that stuff was Ward Kimball. So yeah, those interstitial scenes really, you know, I've heard people compare them to like Monty Python stuff, but you know what? Monty yeah. Python got that from this. Yeah. Yeah. This was first. <laughs> so maybe it is ahead of it. Maybe it was ahead of it. Yeah. Time. The, oh, okay. Now C C D C dog. I get you what you, what you're saying. All right. So, uh, C dog's favorite was the fight scene. We're going to talk about that last. So hold on to that. And also, um, I'm going to talk about, uh, one thing that um, uh, so when you first turn on this movie on Disney Plus, you get the disclaimer, right? The the the, the thing. Yeah. So I right. started it on Disney Plus today, and I got that, and I just shut it off and watched the DVD. Yeah, and then oh, you also you get that warning, but you also get another thing that says edited for content. Yeah. So I I watched it, you know, begrudgingly. <laughs> on Disney Plus because I want to watch my DVD copy and catch what was edited out and I caught it and and I'll share that with you guys later was it uh, something that it was was it a uh, something that oh my gosh why can't I ever remember their name the boy what was the boy's <laughs> yes it's something that Jack Flagg said said and yeah. something that the the uh, captain of the ship the one in which they were returning, the one they were leaving San Francisco once they had all the gold. 
Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll get into it later. Uh, okay. Miss Cater says that her favorite scene is the haircutting scene. And that's the one I was going to talk about. So perfect timing. Um, so they first arrive in San Francisco off the ship. Right. And they're like, okay, we need to find, you know, judge Higgins, you know, we need to get gold. We need to go find the mother load, but we need supplies. And in order to get supplies, they need money to buy it. Mm-hmm. And so <laughs> they devise this plan. Like, you know, they're walking around town and they see, Oh wow. What $10 to get a bath. What the heck? Bring your own soap. <laughs> you, don't, you, don't even your own, you don't even get your own bar of soap <laughs> for 10 bucks guy. <laughs> so he's like, he, he looks I, around at some of the, yeah, go ahead. No, I just $10. And even the price that people were paying back then. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So oh, sorry. Go on. Yeah, totally. It's it's uh, price gouging for sure because people were loaded with gold. Uh, so he notices a lot of folks around town are looking kind of, you know, scraggly looking, hair's kind of long. So they, he's, he sets uh, Jack down on a barrel, starts cutting his hair. Meanwhile, Quentin Bartlett is like, I'll show you guys how to make money, you know. The, the, the world is, whole, is a stage, you know, and he sets a little barrel and he stands on it, puts a little napkin down and his hat upside down and thinks he's going to make a bunch of money, like, uh, what, elucidating to the crowd, you know. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, uh, he, like, has one client. Meanwhile, Bullwhip's got, like, a line of 20 dudes. <laughs> $15 for a haircut, yeah. <laughs> Prices change by the hour, yeah. <laughs> that's right and actually you you know every, you're 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 what you're 10 and the guy with the long hair was 15 and then the next guy comes up he's got like long hair and he takes his hat off and he's bald and he's like oh you're, you're 10 <laughs> <laughs> so he makes a ton of money doing this <laughs> meanwhile um we're introduced to mountain ox right and he's like just bounced the guy and He's like, hey, Sam, I want to go mosey around town. And he discovers that, uh, you know, Bull of Griffin was given haircuts. And I've got all my quotes written down. And I lost my my notepad. So I'm going to have to go from memory, which is pretty bad. I have a bad memory. No, you you have a bad memory. I couldn't even tell you what the kid's name was in the movie. So, oh. I think I've got it here. Here we go. So, he's like, no, oh, this isn't it. This is the wrong notebook. I need to get different notebooks because all of mine look the same. <laughs> so, anyways, it's uh, Mount Knox comes out and he's like, hey, I, I've got a. Uh, I want a haircut and and just like the butler guy he's like so proper he's like i've terminated my business for the day besides if i were to give you a haircut these other gentlemen which i've excused would have been ahead of you and he like grabs him and he's like get your hands get your vulgar hands off of my apparel (laughs) (laughs) i just love his character the way he talks and it's just so funny meanwhile bartlett's like just you know the romans <laughs> gentlemen <laughs> not making any money so he ends up you know they get in a little scuffle with mountain Knox, and he takes some of the gold that he earned with, by doing the haircuts puts it in a glove and whacks him in the face and then he goes flying across in this wagon tips over into like the bath one of the bath houses and you see a guy <laughs> taking a bath in there and immediately everybody's he just knocked out ox oh my gosh <laughs> his name's bullwhip griffin he can beat up a grizzly bear <laughs> Jack said. so he's entered there introduced to sam and, and he wants to do the fight right away but uh you know griffin's like excuse me gentlemen gentlemen i cannot fight now we're off to the gold fields and to go find our guy that stole the map <laughs> so maybe it's some other time so, and the other time comes up later. So what what else do you got in terms of favorite scenes? Of, 
my favorite. So no, that was that was it. I mean, people like the interstitials were going to be my other favorite as well. Yeah. Elmer because said that that his those were also his favorite, like those little breaks the, in the action. The reason they are is because that's what I remember this movie from. Like the first thing I think of when I think of this movie are those interstitials. Uh-huh. And the animation and stuff like that. So yeah, we have to give them that them credit. Yeah. Got to mention that a couple more times. Right. Okay, another one of my favorite scenes was, uh, I guess it was this scene. You know, uh, they they end up going up to the, the they, <laughs> they run into Judge Higgins, who's a dentist, right? And there's this whole crazy thing going on where he, he uh, uh, is going to be hanged because he's actually stealing the gold out of people's teeth. <laughs> and... <laughs> They, Carl Malden was so good in this movie. Oh, I, I know. Think. Yeah, he was hilarious. So good. So he's in this crowd of people about to be hung. Meanwhile, Jack and uh, Griffin discover him. Griffin sticks a rock in Jack's mouth to pretend that he's got a toothache because they need to get the map from the judge. And if he, they kill him, then the map they have no idea where to look for the map. So uh, he ends up uh, saving the judge uh, convincing the crowd that, hey, let the dentist live so he could fix Jack's busted tooth. And they ended up escaping. Um, part of the deal was uh, with the crowd, the townspeople was they were going to hang Judge Higgins. But, you know, while they're waiting to fix his tooth, quote, his ouchy tooth, <laughs> you have to dig his grave. So they're digging the grave, and that's when Bull Griffin finds all the gold. Right? <laughs> mm -hmm. They they strike it rich, and then you get an you get an interstitial scene where um, they're they're the season it's, it goes to winter time, right? And they they have all the gold, and it's like they've made enough money, and now they can go back to Boston. So the that scene switches to them on a ship, right, going to Boston. It turns out that. Like uh, um, Higgins is on that ship too, pretending to be like a Chinese man. <laughs> I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna quote what he did. <laughs> no, <laughs> what he that, said. Yeah. yeah, that would be. That's kind of maybe why the the Disney Plus put the disclaimer on there. We'll did never they, know. Did they? They kept that in. That was in the Disney Plus film, and then okay. so he ends up like uh, kind of kidnapping Jack and he's got like this gold belt around him. Right. So he takes that off. Uh, but Jack gets away with the gold belt and gets thrown into the, the, the bay. Right. And so he's like trying to swim up to the surface. He can't with all that gold. Griffin finds out what's going on. He jumps into the bay without taking the gold off. So he's sinking. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you know, with the the Chinese, the racial slurs, but but Suzanne Pochette is singing around, rolling on the floor in her dress that covers her knees. Come on, Disney. <laughs> yeah, and Suzanne sported a little bit of cleavage in that dress too. So you know, I don't, whatever. <laughs> so, anyways, when uh, they get fished out of the sea, all right. This I'll I'll go ahead and tell you guys what the the um part that was edited out so uh jack gets that he's fished out first and he's like oh it was judge higgins he tried to steal my gold he was dressed up as a coolie and the uh, the captain's like oh go get all the coolies and gather them up and we'll question them all so coolies was the the derogatory term or the racial slur that was edited out uh, for the Disney Plus vision, version. Mm. And coolies, I looked it up, and that's just a term for um, Southeast Asian or East Asian workers that came over to uh, the U.S. to work on projects like the railroad, uh, the go uh, you know, um, working in the towns, uh, building, um, you know, mine tracks and things. 
Right. So, yeah. There's actually a town called Chinese Camp uh, east of Sacramento near Coloma where, where uh, Sutter first discovered gold. Really? Uh, I, I've been there. Yeah. A little town called Chinese Camp. And it's all well known that the Chinese, you know, were, were very heavily uh, employed uh, in gold prospecting efforts. So, yeah, that's that. That was it. Sorry, it wasn't anything bigger than that. <laughs> but it, uh, it also, they edited. No, it yeah. just frustrates me that people from the beginning of time even made up names about people like that. It just. Yeah. That, that, yeah. that's. I, I understand that that's what happened. And, but I wish that it never did happen to begin with. You know what I mean? Yeah. So unfortunately, yeah, that was that was used. It's still on the DVD. So if you watch the DVD, you can hear him say that. And so really, they edited it out to just say men. Um, so it's kind of a non issue. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm all for just keeping things the way they are. Unfortunately, you know, but it, it was, it is what it is. You know, it's the mm -hmm. 60s, like Miss Cater says. That's the way things were back then. Um, I like that they leave stuff in. I don't like that they edit because uh, we can learn from the mistakes of the past and be better. But if they take that stuff out, then uh, we just go on being ignorant, right? Yeah. Yeah. But anyways, really, we just should treat everybody you know, the way we want to be treated and, and not use derogatory racial slurs. <laughs> anyways. But... Amen. Amen. Yeah. So that was uh, the part that was edited. Anyways, I haven't even got to my favorite scene. Yet. <laughs> <laughs> I was setting it up. So they're on the ship. Gold is gone. They have no money, right? So they're like, okay, we need to go back to San Francisco and start all over again, right? That's what Bull Griffin says. It's okay. There's still plenty of gold. We can cut hair again and uh, just mine it all back. Well, when they get there, haircuts are now 50 cents. <laughs> uh, they meet a barber actually that's already there in town and he's given hair. He offered them haircuts for 35 cents and there is no way they're going to make like, what was it? The uh, Even the fare to go back to Boston was like $250. So, so dejected and broke and hungry. They decide to like da dine and dash in a little little diner. There's this guy making stew in there. Yep. And here's where Griffin and hamburger is. patties. <laughs> hamburger patties, yeah. It looks good. Griffin's like, you know what? If we're gonna dine and dash, let's do it at the best place in town. <laughs> let's go to the Lucky <laughs> Nugget. So so Bull and Griffin kind of turns over a new leaf, huh? <laughs> Instead of being the proper uh, gentleman sure. always of his word he's gonna like yeah let's dine and dash the lucky nugget well he runs into ox <laughs> and ox is like bull whip i remember you i'm gonna fix you good <laughs> and uh bull whip's like uh i see nothing that requires fixing at the moment <laughs> <laughs> and so Sam, <laughs> Sam comes out. <coughs> Excuse me. And he's like, "Oh, Bullwhip's back. Time to set up the fight. Come on in. And I'll give you some steak dinners, and you know, we'll 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 get this all squared away." Well, when they're in there, they they uh, hear this gorgeous Boston Bell singing. The girls of San Francisco. <laughs> right. And uh, that's when she discovers that's that's finally when Arabella, you know, who had gone to San Francisco in the first place to to find Jack and Griffin. And so that's when they reunite. And but, <laughs> how do you scene, feel about Griffin's reaction to uh, seeing Suzanne again? Well, the scene is a little odd to me because Suzanne Pochette, Pochette has such a distinct voice and mm -hmm. Jack is her brother and they don't recognize her until they stand up and see her 
like she's literally sung almost the entire song uh -huh. and all the men are standing up around the table watching these ladies dance and then finally jack stands up and he's like oh it's, it's my sister how could you not no, it'd be like Fran Drescher singing, and you had no idea that it's Fran Drescher. It's that <laughs> distinctive a voice. Oh, yeah. Are you talking about from Newhart? I'm talking about from The Nanny. Oh, The Nanny. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's that distinct of a voice, you know what I mean? So, uh -huh. especially when it's your sister, I feel like I would be like, wait a minute, why do I hear my sister singing instead of, oh, I want to see what's going on. Wait, that's my sister. I don't know. I was always thrown off. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Miss Caters is like, it's been a long day for them. They're tired and they're, they got this big juicy steak in front of them. So they're kind of preoccupied, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Director decision, MD Snotty says, yeah. I guess they're trying to like, you know, kind of play it out a little longer, you know. Um, it's so funny that, that Jack's the one that stands up on his chair. And he's like, hey, Arabella, we're over here. Wow, you're so pretty. I can't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> and then she just stops singing. I know. She just runs off the stage. Jack! Rose! Oh, <laughs> Rose! <laughs> Jack! Jack! Come back, a Come ship, back. a boat. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, man, that was bad. <laughs> okay. Brian, you are on one today. Uh, <laughs> I'm tired. It's been a long day, just like them. <laughs> I could use a juicy steak. <laughs> so, great scene. I love the, re the reuniting scene. It's fun. And I, I love Suzanne's character and how she deals with like Sam and how he just kind of, he's obviously got the hots for Sam, but so does Griffin and Griffin doesn't really let on that. Uh, he, 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 he's like, Arabella is a lady and I'm the butler. He recognizes the whole class thing, but then that kind of dissolves away as they spend more time in San Francisco, which is the aristocracy is not part of that lifestyle. So their true feelings come out and, and Cupids are flying around blowing trumpets. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. It's such an odd, that, that part is so bizarre. When I saw that for the first time, I was like, my son and I were watching it and we just looked at each other and just started crying. It was so, we, we watched that part over and over again. Ah, uh, so funny. Okay. Uh, any more favorite scenes? Because the last favorite scene for me is uh, the fight scene. Should we get into the fight scene and then call it a night? Yes. I've got a few fun facts to share after the fight scene, but um, yeah. So Let's do it. Go ahead. Fight scene. Uh, all right. What, what, okay, tell us your favorite part. I've got it. The fight scene is so long, right? It's like 20 minutes. It's very, it's, yeah, it literally, I think, is 20 minutes long. But yeah. that's, that's like they were building up to it. Uh huh. You knew it was going to happen. You right? knew it was going to happen. And, and, um, the, the special effects are just so fun and mm -hmm. wacky. And wacky, yeah. And I, I we keep they they wacky, did not but... disappoint here. No, at and all. you alluded to it, but my favorite part is when who is it? Ox gets thrown into the crowd, and then they all get blown up into the air, and then the one of the saloon girls is falling down her umbrella dress. Her. It's like, <laughs> yeah, you expect that to happen. Like I literally <laughs> watched that. And I watch the woman get thrown in the air and all the men or whatever. And I'm like, if they don't have the dress open up like an umbrella, then they've missed the mark. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, and well, they didn't. They didn't. <laughs> <laughs> what happened there? It was like bullwhip 
got punched, right? He flew across he, the room into like a, like into a canvas the, siding. Yeah, the wall of the tent or whatever. Yeah, and bounced off of it, right? And then he hit. Yes. Uh, was that the knockout blow? Uh, that was the knockout blow because Ox that, didn't get up after that, right? It's possible. I yeah, don't remember all the specifics. Yeah, the, I, I, yeah, that's what happened. They were both knocked out. And then the, the timekeeper or the judge, um, oh, my gosh, that I didn't even mention that guy in the cast. The judge is like, his name's Honeycut. Oh, he's in so many movies, too. He's like, you got to toe the line. You got to toe the line. And time's ticking. You got 60 seconds to toe the line. And so Bartlett is running over. He's like, it's getting close, 40, 41, you know, 50, 58. And he, like, steals the triangle from the guy <laughs> so he can't <laughs> whack it. To And uh, so then they get Griffin to toe the line, and he wins. And then he's like, are you looking for this? <laughs> Whacks the triangle. <laughs> oh. I, I also like the part where Griffin is, like, leaning backwards. And he's almost oh, yeah. like down to the ground. <laughs> and Ox is like, yeah. you know, and he grabs him by the belt and pulls by him back. By the belt. <laughs> <laughs> is it that's like uh he steps on his foot, right? And uh I gets think so, him. yeah. Yeah. Uh my favorite part of the whole fight scene is I think it's the second round, and you know that's the one that Bullwhip wins, and he's like running all over the place. And then I think I think Arabella has a deal with the saloon band to start playing like some the typical ballad music, right? And it's like mm -hmm, they mm -hmm. play this song and Bullwhip starts dancing and then Ox is like kind of, hey, this is kind of catchy. <laughs> and they're both kind of <laughs> leaning and like and John and yeah, like Miss M skaters is like leaning and taunting and jaunting around. They're dancing around, and it's just like they kind of forget that they're fighting. <laughs> but then that, uh, yeah, and then that punch. <laughs> I love that punch. But okay, oh, so then the, the, this whole scene makes me wonder what who who was this movie supposed to be for? <laughs> I don't know. It's like the hopefully some of the kids stayed awake to watch this you know, <laughs> at the end. I, I think it was it. Well, that's why Disney uses child actors all the time in their movies, like so that the kids have someone to relate to. So they're all rooting for Jack throughout. Yeah, but and there's then, only one child in yeah. this film. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't, Good question. I mean, it, apparently it didn't work very well because they didn't because it lost money. But yeah. Uh, but I will say that I do enjoy, like I, I do enjoy it. Mm -hmm. And even though yeah. it's not a musical, yeah. I feel like it is a musical with all the interstitials. Yeah, and, and it's that song is so catchy. I just love it. Great, great song, great music, great fighting sequence, great special effects. I love when when Bullwhip gets a, lands a punch, or he, he like punches Ox in the stomach, and then you get a close up of his hand, and it's like these little animated stars are coming out. Of it. Right. <laughs> well, yeah, and, all the little cartoon stuff, like like you yeah. mentioned earlier about him getting green with envy, and then his face turns green. Yep. And then Ox's eyes get red, and his smoke blows out of his ears. That was mm -hmm. animated. Um. Yeah, and then just the funny parts where Ox is running, like they, they they do the camera speed up trick, and he's running across the room. And he like dives into the to try to punch out Griffin, and then he like flies through the bass drum, and then <laughs> he gets his his fist is stuck in a in a trombone to the point where he's like yeah. ripped apart the bell of the trombone. <laughs> and what's so funny about that part is like Griffin's like, oh. Wow, it's like your your fist is in the bell. Let me help you get that off to like free up his fist so he can start using it again. I think, like, dude, <laughs> leave the trombone on his fist. Oh, but he's so good, he's so nice. Yeah. Well, that's uh, 
Any anybody else have any favorite scenes? Lots of comments that it's a great movie. Disney fans of all ages love this movie. Yeah, I I, I will always love this movie, and it'll be one that I turn to often. I think. Um, let's see. Some. Let me go through my notes here real quick. Oh yeah, I love the laws, courts, and justice. Yes, sir. That's what I'm interested in in San Francisco. And I, I might go up to the gold fields later. But it's laws, courts, and justice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was Judge Higgins' quote. Uh, Judge, okay. so, oh, Judge Higgins was so good in this film. He reminded me of um, like an even more, like a sinister Robert Preston, Harold Hill from The Music Man. He oh, actually okay. yeah. sounded like him several times mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. Yeah, like he was this bamboozler, and uh, yeah, it he was just so good, and I love because I've always loved him in Pollyanna. That's where I, I would imagine mm, most sure. people Disney fans realize yeah. or recognize him from, and I love him in that. And you know, he's the preacher, and then on this one, he's just he's awful, and I don't want anybody to die. But also, when he's about to be hanged, it's like. Well, you're terrible. <laughs> like the stuff he did, the stuff he did didn't deserve him to be hanged, but it's like uh, if you save him, you know that he's just going to be he's going to go yeah. back on all of his. Words. He's never going to turn over. He's never going to become a good guy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's see. What else do I have written here? Um, you know, the when they're leaving Boston, that harbor. The matte paintings really reminded me a lot of Johnny Tremaine. So a lot of great um, Peter Ellenshaw uh, um, yeah. matte painting is in this film. Again. Uh, oh, fire in the hole when, when uh, Judge Higgins says. Uh, oh, I paused there. When uh, Judge Higgins fakes the fire, you hear this whistle from the boat the whole time, and that's the Mark Twain whistle that they recorded for that scene. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. The Mark Twain steamship from, mm. from uh, Disneyland. Uh, just yeah. a comment from Miss Cater says, if Arabelle was grandchild, how old was she supposed to be in this movie and then work in a brothel? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I don't know. Uh, let's see. Brian Russell was 12. She was probably, I would say, mid-20s, late-20s. That's a, quite an yeah. age difference. Yeah. I don't know. It's yeah, hard I'm to, not like, sure. I don't know about you, but as I get older, like, I look back. Like, I'll watch a movie like this, and while I'm watching it, I'll pull up IMDb or whatever, and I'll look at people's ages, and I'm like, oh, my gosh. Like, they look a lot older than 24 in real life. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Right. <laughs> or they'll, I'll, I'll be like, oh, my gosh, they were my age? They look so old. <laughs> <laughs> right. Time is a weird thing. I have to plug in my phone here. I'm off the headphones, so we're going to wrap up. But a couple other things. Making sure it charges. I'm not sure it's doing it. Okay. Uh, last couple things here. Uh, this was Brian Russell's last movie. And uh, he actually played in another movie with Carl Malden. He was Carl Malden's son in How the West Was Won. So that's a fun little tidbit. Oh. Uh, we talked about Roddy breaking his right hand already. And then this during the fight scene. Remember, he is pretty upset with Ox for not following the Marquis of Queensberry rules of boxing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which I looked those up. Those were developed in 1860, and this movie took place in 1850. So, <laughs> either he had an inside scoop on the he was friends with the Marquis of Queensbury, and and let, he, he lent um, Griffin a copy, <laughs> <laughs> or, or what Griffin was just ahead of his time. 
Yeah, he was, right? Or yeah, he time traveled. <laughs> uh, we talked about, oh, there was a so really interesting thing. When the movie came out in 67, uh, King Features had a, they were going to do a comic strip of this movie. And there was oh, even yeah. talk of this being like a, a series. So, um, which begs, the question was, were there more adventures besides the ones we saw in the film? And those would probably be, uh, would come out in the comic strip. Well, this is a story that leans itself to a plethora, unlimited adventures, really. Oh, you know? yeah, for sure. Like, you could totally, so, uh, yeah. Just the way Bullwhip is, his mannerisms, keeping to his word, being gentlemanly, and just... He took advantage of every situation he was placed in, right? Mm -hmm. And that, mm -hmm. that could be a recurring theme for, for the comic strip or television episodes. Yeah, yeah. I feel like if this, if this was made today, I feel like it wouldn't have been a film. It would have been a television show. Yeah. He's such a great character. Totally. You just totally, uh, you're on his side the whole time. And mm -hmm. he's kind of endearing that way, his, the way he acts. So. I Plus, agree. he can part. He parts his hair like from the top, from his forehead all the way back down to his neck. You know, so if you're into that real stylish butler hair, <laughs> you're like, you know, I am. Yeah, I know. You know, you're drawn right in. <laughs> Look for a new Disney Plus remake series this fall, Adventures of Bullwhip Griffin. <laughs> that would be awesome. Would I would be totally awesome. continue my subscription for that. So, okay. Last thing I, I just laughed at in this movie was the bandito scene with Joby Baker. <laughs> just like, mm -hmm. I, I didn't know. I was like, I'm looking at that guy. He looks really familiar. Is that Silky Seymour? Yeah, unfortunately it is. But <laughs> yeah, there there is one part where he's like, um, Judge Higgins and Bullwhip are talking about the jacket, how he sewed the map in the liner, and he's like, they're 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 talking about something, some kind of business, and Joey Baker's like, first we take care of our business, then you talk, and then Griffin's like, oh. I'm so sorry. So he, and then he puts his hands back up in the air. Like, yeah, he was <laughs> breaching, he was breaching bandito hold up etiquette there momentarily. <laughs> uh, that was just so it's funny. Little, I will say it, it is little things like that, that I enjoy the most about this because the story yeah. is pretty flat mm -hmm. in this film. It's not really a, big nail biter or whatever but little things like right. that and the interstitials and all of that kind of stuff that's what stands out to me the most yeah yeah and, and like the painting mm -hmm. and, and all of that yeah it's those little moments like there's so there's so many of them they just like you look for them to happen mm -hmm. and you laugh yeah totally so uh yeah, this is just one of my favorite Disney films of the 60s. Uh, just, uh, It's just one of those that you can put on and laugh. Great characters, great cast. Um, yeah, the story is kind of like, eh. But it's the adventures and the fight scene and the special effects that really make it. And, of course, the interstitials. So much fun. So that's a, a wrap. you have any final words for Bob Griffin? No, I mean, if, I'm sure that everybody here has seen it, but if on the off chance you have not, check it out. Mm -hmm. Even it, even on Disney Plus, uh, check it out because uh, what they cut on Disney Plus didn't re doesn't really matter as far yeah. as the story goes. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Don't let the disclaimer sh uh, deter you from watching this, and because if you do. If you don't watch this, I'm going to get Mountain Knox to bounce you out of the Lucky Nugget. <laughs> oh, Joby Baker was in Super Dad? Okay. All right. I need to watch that one again. So uh, we'll, we'll be back in, a, in, a, in another few weeks. Um, we're not going to be able to do Thursdays anymore for the going forward for the rest of this year because I'm teaching a 
college algebra course at a local junior college uh, this semester. And I teach Tuesday, Thursday nights. So Jared and I will get together and determine what, what night uh, we're going to do this and what our next film would be. I think we had talked about Pete's Dragon, but I kind of mm -hmm. wanted to run an idea by Jared here tonight on air. Okay. Uh, Jared's been sharing a lot of cool like 80s and 90s films. So I, I thought it would be kind of fun to like fast forward and, and do like one of your favorite uh, VHS movies. One of my favorite VHS movies? Yeah, like these rare Disney Sunday movies that, that you like a lot, like a lot. So maybe pick your favorite one and uh, right. we can talk about that. Yeah. What do you guys think in, in the audience? Like we're going to do Pete's Dragon next, that's for sure. But then after that, we're going to do, maybe we'll jump ahead. Because I, I want to start watching some of those. Um, I've actually been watching a, a bunch of them lately. I yeah. broke out. I broke out the VCR. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Yeah, I've got I've got the VCR. I just need to find them. I don't know where you find it. So. Well, I've had a lot of them since I was yeah. young. Well, I don't know where I can find them. I and I find like it's some to go on eBay. That, like I find, I go to thrift stores a lot, and I do. I've, I've found a bunch. Okay. Actually. Um, I've actually never seen it. It's not a Disney film, but I went to a, a Salvation Army yesterday and got a DVD of this movie called Endless Night that has Haley Mills in it. Wow. Oh, Agatha, that, that's the one. It's Agatha Christie. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, that's right. The Agatha Christie movie. She was in the, Okay, I remember when I was on the Jiminy Crickets podcast, we did a Haley Mills episode and Ruthie talked about that. Yeah, yeah, so I'm excited to watch that. Okay, there, and there was a movie you shared last week that had, that Haley Mills was in. Um, oh, Back Home. Back Home. Yeah, I'd never even heard of that one before. Oh yeah, it's good. Oh, I didn't that know she had YouTube. another. Oh, it's on YouTube. It is on YouTube. Yes. Okay, I'll have to check that out. So uh, we'll be back uh, next month with uh, Pete's Dragon, I think. Uh, that's another fun movie. I love Jim Dale in that movie. Oh, yes. And he just recently had a birthday. Did he? He did, yeah. Yeah. I mean, if we're going to do Pete's Dragon and get talk all about Jim Dale, we might as well go ahead and do Hot Lead and Cold Feet because I think he's even better in that one. Uh, I, I've seen Hot Lead and Cold Feet. It's been a minute, though. Yeah. Well, he plays three different characters in that movie. You know, the the whole premise is uh, he's got a twin brother. That's like, there's the good Jim Dale. Like, I think he's like a minister coming into this town. Mm -hmm. And his brother is like the the villain or the criminal of the town. He stirs things up. <laughs> And then oh. he also plays, like, I think their grandfather or something that was going to uh, bequeath, like, a fortune to them. But it turns out they don't – it's whoever wins this crazy race is, gets to win the, the inheritance or something. <laughs> yeah, I'll have it's to bring that movie. one out again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's really good. It's got a lot of those famous Disney family actors. And I think Karen Valentine – we talked about in the North yeah, Avenue Irregulars is in that. Yeah. So, all right. Well, uh, that'll do it for tonight. Uh, all about Bullet Griffin. And uh, hope you enjoyed it. And uh, again, if you are interested in the album, you want the audio from this album, just send me a direct message through Instagram. I'll add you to a Dropbox folder list and uh, i'll send this audio over to you free of charge let's just appreciate uh you listening in all and me listen to jared and i blab and blab <laughs> and blab and blab about yeah about roddy mcdowell so good night everybody thank you everybody it's been a pleasure love all of you we love these movies keep watching them ttfn
Uh huh. TTFN. All right. Good night, everyone. Bye bye.